This is CNN. On the front line in Kuwait, Iraq's President Saddam Hussein again asserts no compromise. In Baghdad, Iraqis pledge their support to Saddam, their chants and Iraq's official rhetoric take on a warlike tone. We are fully prepared now for confrontation and for crushing the evil heads. President Bush consults his advisors, takes a quiet walk, and offers prayer as the commander-in-chief contemplates sending more than 415,000 U.S. troops into combat. The Department of Defense is ready to execute any order we might receive from the president. Bernard Shaw joins us live from Baghdad and CNN correspondents in Washington, Saudi Arabia, Amman, and at the United Nations will also have live reports. In Washington, I'm David French. I'm Lou Waters at CNN Center in Atlanta. This is our nightly special report, Crisis in the Gulf. Four hours remain until the U.N. deadline for Iraq to get out of Kuwait, and what happens in those hours may help determine whether there is war or peace in the Persian Gulf. As the deadline approaches, Saddam Hussein reported he has made a personal appeal to his troops in Kuwait. Be ready for war. CNN's Bernard Shaw joins us on the line from Baghdad with more on what President Saddam has been saying and doing on this critical day in the desert. Bernie. The man who led his nation into war against Iran in the last decade is rallying his soldiers for a confrontation in the 90s. President Saddam Hussein returned to the front, returned to Kuwait on this deadline day, the country he invaded last August. He addressed some of the troops. He walked among them, talking, encouraging them, looking at weapons, looking at fortifications. At one point during this visit, we don't know how long it was, but at one point, this is part of what Saddam Hussein told his men who are in Kuwait to try to hold on to Kuwait. We are ready for them, and we will show them what they've never seen before. We are protecting the land and the sea after this battle, there will be prosperity for everyone in Iraq. We hope that they will not fight, because we do not want to spill blood. We are humanitarians, we Iraqis. But if they get involved and uh, they think little of the Iraqis, then God will help us to get a triumphant victory. That was their commander at the front in Kuwait. We do not know at this hour whether or not President Saddam has returned to Baghdad following his schedule, is gleaning information about his movements after the fact, and uh, we expect later today to hear more from the leader of this country. Here in Baghdad, during the day, Tuesday, as you walked among the streets and talked to people, looked into their eyes, you could see fear, you could see worry, you could see reflection, you could see confidence, you could see any human emotion. You could also sense hope, hope that there will be no war. Lou? Thank you, Bernie. It's just past 4 a.m. in Baghdad. We have more now on the mood of the Iraqi people as they stare down the U.N. deadline and brace for possible battle. With that story, CNN's John Holloman. Sunset in Baghdad on January 15th. At the main downtown bus station, large crowds, most of them soldiers, trying to get home at the end of a long, tense day. Waiting for her bus, Hamdiya Jassim with her nine-month-old Nihad. She says she's not worried about the deadline in the desert, but had a different answer when we asked if she's willing to sacrifice her baby and her other children in a coalition attack just to keep Kuwait. I'm not ready to sacrifice with Nihad, but all of us must be sacrificed for Kuwait. 
This 14-year-old and every other Iraqi man has been given a rifle by the government. This man says he's been told to look out for U.S. paratroopers. We will receive them uh, warmly and we will shoot them. And late in the evening, Information Minister Latif Jassim called us to say Iraqis are not terrified by the American Rambo, that even though America has advanced weapons, Iraq has God on its side and his government has no plan to back down. We are fully prepared now for confrontation and for crushing the evil heads. All over the country, there were demonstrations of support for President Saddam Hussein and hatred for Americans, especially the president. As the demonstrators shouted, it was quiet from the diplomats. After several days of frantic last-minute diplomatic effort, nothing seemed to be working. In the center of downtown, a different kind of demonstration. The mosque, the sermon is about war and the cost of war. At the main shopping district, most of the stores are closed. And on Rashid Street, Baghdad's main thoroughfare, it's almost deserted. After days of stocking up, people are at home, waiting. The Iraqis may not be worried. At least they tell us they're not. But when you look in their eyes, you can see increasing expressions of anxiety with each passing hour. John Holloman, CNN, on what is usually the busiest street in Baghdad. An air of anxiety also hangs over Washington as the deadline draws nearer. President Bush spent the day quietly consulting with his advisors and the members of the clergy. CNN senior White House correspondent Charles Bierbauer reports most of the activity took place outside the gates. <laughs> Demonstrators paced Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. Inside, officials were struck by the uncomfortable calm as the president quietly met with his national security staff, lunched with key advisors, and met with the Economic Policy Council. Waiting to hear from our economic experts and team and independents about uh, what's happening in the economy, what might happen in the economy. It is, White House officials say, too soon to tell and it is almost too late to turn back. U.S. officials have little hope for a diplomatic reversal. No blood royal! No blood royal! No blood royal! The demonstrations are small but symbolic, a faint but growing reminder of an unpopular war fought two decades ago. President Bush took a long contemplative early morning walk on the quiet south side of the White House and called the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Uh, simply what he said was that obviously we have disagreements and uh, that, that, um, that these are disagreements that he respects, uh, that he thought that I, I, I with the other religious leaders had taken a high moral ground, but he was, being, he was feeling being called uh, to solving this solution in another way, which uh, is by military strength. Especially this day do we pray for our president, and all the leaders of the nations. Congressional voices exposed worry and frustration. Senator John Chafee voted for the war resolution and yet is concerned. He who underestimates the enemy does so at terrible peril. Neither clothing nor equipment determine the fighting spirit of a unit. What more can the world do? Practically nothing. One senator suggested a last resort. Say that I would hope that the president would do just a simple thing like that. Just pick up the phone, call Saddam Hussein in, in Baghdad. White House officials say such a phone call is not an option. Spokesman Marlon Fitzwater says the option is Saddam Hussein's to get out before time runs out. You must leave the White House sidewalk at this time or be subject to arrest. This is your third and final warning. Time ran out for the protesters outside the White House Nearly 70 were removed quietly, while inside, President Bush was described as at peace with himself, ready to make the tough decisions ahead. Bishop Browning, who spoke with the president today, said that Mr. Bush is not stressed, not strained. Indeed, the president is trying to have what's described as a normal evening, going home, watching the news, having dinner, going to bed. But this has been anything but a normal day. David? Charles, how will the president tell us if there is war? 
Well, one is not exactly sure, but I could uh, predict a scenario perhaps that runs along this line. First, he calls his spokesman, Mr. Fitzwater, into the Oval Office to say, Marlin, the bombers are on their way. I wouldn't expect that Mr. Fitzwater would know in advance. You'll have to go out and tell him, says the president. And Mr. Fitzwater then proceeds to the briefing room, or if it's in the middle of the night, calls us all in, and the phones ring by our bedsides, and announces that, indeed, uh, war has begun. And the Pentagon will then be called upon to give out details, and I think we could expect the president to go on television to address the nation and the world to explain what he is doing. All of this dependent, of course, on him giving the order to go ahead and launch an attack. David? Charles Bierbauer, live at the White House. Thank you very much. Lou? Still ahead, UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar makes a final appeal to Iraq. Pentagon planners try to predict Saddam Hussein's next move as U.S. troops stand by to find out whether they'll be ordered into war. And around the world, the calls for peace grow louder and more desperate. How far do you think it is? Oh, about 140 miles. And there ain't a thing out there. Reliability isn't a sticker you put on the windshield. It's something you darn well better design in from the start. This is far. This is forever. You know, we're not selling these cars to mechanics. It could be someone like your mother, and they just gotta know they won't be left sitting somewhere by the side of the road. I mean, that's the way I would want it if I was a customer. Hey, look at this. Civilization. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Hi. Was I scared? Well, what'd the doctor say? He said my hemorrhoids aren't that serious. Yeah? That I don't need surgery. That's great. He said to eat right and exercise, and for flare-ups, use Preparation H. Oh, it's terrific. Yeah. Thousands of doctors distribute this care guide. It advises a fiber-rich diet, exercise, and to help relieve hemorrhoidal symptoms, try Preparation H. I feel so much better. You think you feel better? Preparation H, in ointment and suppositories. Once upon a time, there was a prince of a guy that everyone thought was a toad. Pain in the neck. You would do best to avoid him. Except for a beautiful princess who loved him warts and all. He's French. One magical day, she gave him a kiss and turned him into a... Gorgeous. Sensual. Charming man. And they lived happily ever after. Quite a story. Yes, it is. From the director of Dead Poet Society comes a thoroughly modern fairy tale. Green Card, rated PG-13. Now playing in select cities. Starts Friday everywhere. Some people are still wondering if PIP printing does multicolor printing. The answer is yes, we do a little. Enough to fill this little football field every day. Color printing. One more reason PIP printing's the biggest business printer in the world. Tonight, the eve of the deadline in the Gulf, but there's still opposition in Congress for the use of force. Senator John Warner and Representative Joe Kennedy battle over U.S. tactics. Tonight on Larry King Live, 9 Eastern on CNN. A final appeal from United Nations Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar tonight, a last-ditch attempt to convince Saddam Hussein to get out of Kuwait. This as the Security Council scraps all last efforts for peace in the Gulf. CNN's Jeannie Most joins us live now from the UN. Jeannie. David, here at the UN, it all boiled down to one last heartfelt appeal from the Secretary General of the United Nations to Saddam Hussein, an appeal that included an assurance that once the crisis is over, every effort will be made to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, the Secretary General made his statement to a big room full of reporters, but really, he made it directly to Saddam Hussein. The world stands poised between peace and war. I most sincerely appeal to President Saddam Hussein to turn the course of events away from catastrophe. Now, the Secretary General said that if Iraq commenced an immediate total withdrawal, A, that uh, Saddam Hussein wouldn't be attacked, UN peacekeepers could be deployed, uh, the Secretary General could urge the Security Council to review the sanctions and encourage foreign forces to be phased out. But perhaps the most important thing he had to say, the Secretary General had to say, had to do with the question everyone calls linkage. Here is some of what the Secretary General said. I have every assurance, once again from the highest levels of government, 
that with the resolution of the present crisis, every effort will be made to address in a comprehensive manner the Arab-Israeli conflict, including the Palestinian question. I pledge my, my every effort to this end. And later, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. made it clear to reporters that what the Secretary General said was all right with the U.S., that the U.S. did not consider that the dreaded linkage that the U.S. is always saying it cannot deal with. I guess linkage is in the eye of the beholder. We have had no response yet from Iraq to this appeal made by the Secretary General of the U.N. And by the way, I might mention that Tunisia, one of the countries here at the U.N., is circulating a document calling for a Mideast peace conference and actually setting a date no later than June 1991. That is something that is not being pushed hard yet, but it is something that is being circulated here in the halls. Now, uh, what also went on here at the U.N. happened outside the U.N., actually. There were demonstrations all day long, and also there was a candlelight vigil tonight about 300 people gathered. Among other things, they recited the names of soldiers who have already died in Operation Desert Shield, soldiers who have been killed in accidents and whatnot. And all day long, as I mentioned, there have been uh, demonstrations outside as the UN makes a last bid for peace inside. When the midnight deadline actually comes, it's possible this building will practically be empty except for reporters. I'm Ginny Mose reporting live from the United Nations. And still ahead. A live report from Saudi Arabia, where U.S. troops await their orders. In time, all definitions must be revised. But when it came to redefining luxury, it wasn't a Webster. It was Oldsmobile, the all-new 98. Now you can have anti-lock brakes, fuel-efficient power, computerized suspension, Technology found in cars costing thousands more, which by my definition, could be the greatest luxury of all. And you can always take a Webster at his word. This is the new, the new 98 luxury redefined. Generation of Olds. What's your first priority? Miss Crowley. Well, I'm assuming there's product in the pipeline, so... Assuming, Miss Crowley. Unfortunately, assuming doesn't feed the bulldog. The top business schools prepare you for every eventuality you will ever encounter in the business world. Except one, business travel. We've got that one covered. United. Come fly the friendly skies. How can Miss Crowley's three-person sales force stay on top of her far-flung enterprise? From the director of Dead Poet Society comes Green Card. The movie critics are hailing as the season's happiest surprise. Woo! Yes, definitely. Sneak Previews calls it an irresistible romance. Oh, it's fantastic. It's the perfect love story, raves Pat Collins. He's very kind to people. And CBS proclaims it utterly charming. Green Card gets four stars. Bravo! Don't miss the best-reviewed comedy of the year. Green Card, rated PG-13. Now playing in select cities. Starts Friday everywhere. Ask any two people to describe the New Yorker, and chances are you won't hear the same word twice. For those who want the intellect stirred, there's Pulitzer Prize winning fiction. For those who want wit, there's humor and satire. Plus the latest on music, art, dance, sports, and of course, the New Yorker's famous cartoons. Get 52 weekly issues of the New Yorker for just $25.95, 70% off the newsstand price. And get this brand new cartoon collection free with your paid subscription. Call 1-800-257-1257. The Pentagon not only is planning a possible attack upon Iraq, it also is preparing for the possibility that Iraq might launch the first strike. CNN's Pentagon correspondent Wolf Blitzer has our report. Pentagon officials have by no means ruled out the possibility that Iraq may fire the first shots in a Gulf War. U.S. intelligence estimates continue to suggest that Saddam Hussein believes he can suffer a major military setback while at the same time emerge the winner politically. If the Iraqi leader is convinced that a U.S. strike is imminent, he may order a first strike using his ballistic missiles against targets in eastern Saudi Arabia and more likely in Israel. Intelligence analysts say Saddam Hussein could emerge an Arab world hero by inflicting a punishing blow on Israel or the Allied forces while at the same time not backing down. But that assumes he survives what U.S. officials say will be a massive, sustained U.S. offensive. The Pentagon says Iraq has moved more troops, tanks, armored personnel carriers, and artillery pieces into Kuwait. 
and Iraq has expanded its fortifications west of Kuwait in an effort to stop any flanking U.S. ground assault. We don't see any evidence that they're in any way pulling out of Kuwait. Quite the contrary, from our last briefing, the number of forces, tanks, artillery pieces, and so forth has gone up, which is certainly not consistent with uh, their withdrawal. There are now more than 415,000 U.S. troops in the region and another 265,000 allied forces. They are supported by six aircraft carrier battle groups, more than 100 other warships, and some 2,700 combat aircraft, including these F-117A stealth fighters that are expected to launch any U.S. airstrike. In the first few days, maybe the first few hours, as a matter of fact, this intense bombardment which will begin the war, perhaps the enemy forces will crack and break and, and throw down their arms. We would have to be very lucky for that to happen, and we can't count on it. I would think it would last uh, certainly weeks, maybe even months. Pentagon officials say Saddam Hussein has repeatedly miscalculated over the years, yet they acknowledge he has managed to survive. Privately, they say his current miscalculation may wind up costing him not only his political survival, but his physical survival as well. Lou? Uh, just a short while ago, Wolf, we heard uh, Pat Buchanan of Crossfire mention that B-52s were being flown to the Persian Gulf from Diego Garcia. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, uh, Lou, CNN can confirm that in the past few days, the U.S. Air Force has moved about 20 B-52 long-range strategic bombers from the Indian Ocean Island of Diego Garcia to the Middle East, to a country in the Middle East. Pentagon officials are refusing to name that country, citing security concerns and political sensitivities. But those B-52s with those huge bombs are now closer to Iraq if necessary. They will not necessarily have to have extensive mid-air refueling, which would have been the case if they would have remained in Diego Garcia, which is about 3,000 miles away from Iraq. All right, Wolf Blitzer at the Pentagon. Now to David French in Washington. The multinational force in the Gulf very soon could be ordered to move against Iraq. CNN's Rick Salinger joins us from Saudi Arabia to assess the mood of the troops there right now as they wait. David, the mood is anticipation that at long last the job that they have been sent here to do may finally be done and then they can go home. The deadline may be midnight in New York at the United Nations, but that's 8 o'clock in the morning here in Saudi Arabia. Bright daylight, not the best time for an offensive attack. But the Pentagon has said one would come perhaps sooner rather than later. If so, the U.S. Air Force would be first into action. We went today to a desert Air Force base at an undisclosed location and talked to the reserves of the 706 Tactical Fighter Squadron out of New Orleans, Louisiana, and we asked them their thoughts. Now, on the brink of war. This isn't an exercise, and uh, I think each of us are dealing with that in our best, uh, our best ways that we can. Obviously, it uh, gives us some cause of, uh, for pause and, and looking back and our family and loved ones, etc. We do a lot of pre-planning. We uh, do a lot of soul searching. We think about uh, our families back home and why we're here and the reasons we're here. And we all have to think of that before we even flew over here. I feel ready. We've been training a long time. I've been doing this for uh, 14 years, so uh, I've had quite a lot of practice, so we'll have to see how we do. We'll uh, defeat Saddam Hussein and his army. and. Uh, I don't think we really have too much to worry about at this base. It's a matter of carrying out the mission uh, in a proper and in a safe manner. And it looks like that we're going to have to do this. So uh, the sooner we get it over with, the better. Then we can go back home and be with our families, and I can go back to work. While they have been living in relative comfort, the Marines and soldiers out in the desert, many have been here for over five months through the blistering heat of summer, the bone-chilling cold desert nights, and now the rainy days of January. At last, they hope the end may finally be in sight, whenever that may be. One soldier we talked to likened this all to the countdown to the Super Bowl. Only he said, this won't be like Vietnam. We're going for a touchdown. No three-yard drives up the middle. David? Rick, are the coalition troops concerned a lot or not very much about the possibility of a preemptive strike by Iraqi forces? Of course they are concerned. That is indeed a possibility. And the concern here in Saudi Arabia can be seen on two fronts, militarily and in the civilian population. They are worried militarily that the Iraqis could launch some of their Scud missiles at perhaps some of the air bases in Saudi Arabia or troop concentrations, trying to knock out much of the air power before it is turned against them. 
In the civilian population, air raid drills have been going on here, and most of the people have gas masks. Now an essential piece of the equipment they carry with them, perhaps as common as their coats. As they say, they want to be prepared for the worst and hope for the best. Rick Salinger, thank you. A good early morning to you. When we come back, Egypt's president delivers a final appeal to Saddam Hussein. One word. Hussein. I could take a taxi. No, don't worry, Dad. I'll drive you. Total safety? I suppose we could all stay home or ride around in M1 tanks. But we're working on practical solutions. Honey, we're never going to make it. Dad will make it. Analog brakes. Standard equipment on more and more of our cars. Rain or snow, you can come to a nice, clean stop. You build someone a safer car, you get yourself a good night's sleep. Well, we made it. Do it all the time. A lot of the ideas that come into PIP printing look pretty amazing. But thanks to our LookSmart Desktop Publishing, they all go out looking pretty amazing. Desktop Publishing. One more reason PIP printing's the biggest business printer in the world. Did you know that you can send beautiful flowers like these anytime, anywhere to anyone by calling one phone number? The number is 1-800-Flowers, because now more than 5,000 of America's finest florists have the same telephone number, 1-800-Flowers. All you need is a telephone and a major credit card. Just pick up the phone and call 1-800-F-L-O-W-E-R-S, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, toll free. 1-800-Flowers, we're America's florist. As the crisis builds to a climax, CNN is the network for the most complete coverage. From the inner sanctum of the Oval Office to strategic planning in the Pentagon, the banks of the Nile in Cairo, to the chambers of the Security Council, from the front lines of the Saudi desert and the streets of Baghdad, the latest developments in Israel and a Jordan caught in the middle. Now, more than ever, shouldn't you be watching the network viewers voted best in coverage of the crisis in the Gulf? CNN. Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak says the world is waiting for one word from Saddam Hussein, peace. In a speech to his people, Mr. Mubarak said he's pleading with the Iraqi president on behalf of fathers and mothers everywhere. He said Egypt has no quarrel with the Iraqi people or their leader, but the world has taken a position and is trying to make Saddam Hussein listen. The whole world is not wrong. It is not possible that the whole world and its leadership with all its forces, whether big or small, it is not possible that all these countries are really taking a, a, a position that is hostile to you or to Iraq or the Iraqi army. The Egyptian leader said war in the Gulf could be the most dangerous event for humanity since World War II. The British Parliament has given overwhelming backing to its government to use war, if necessary, to force Iraq out of Kuwait. Speaking before the House of Commons, British Prime Minister John Major said his country will fight if it has to. We do not want a conflict. We are not thirsting for war. Though if it comes, I must say to the House, I believe it would be a just war. However great the costs of such a war may be, in my view, they would be less than those that we would face if we failed to stand up for the principle of what is right and to stand up for it now. Protesters in the public gallery briefly disrupted the Prime Minister's speech, shouting, we don't want war. Ahead on the special report on the crisis in the Gulf, the mood in the city that Saddam Hussein has vowed to make his first target, Tel Aviv. Uh, sorry, Lou, and a live report from Amman on King Hussein's address to the Jordanian people. Are you on the first to my IGT charge card. I get 25% off all my purchases with over 3,300 locations nationwide. IGT, in good taste. Tomorrow's charge card today. For 
Further information and application, please call 1-800-4IGT-USA. I didn't think my collection was of much value. Then I went to Emerald Hills Rare Coins. Not everything was valuable, but one piece was. They paid me top price for everything. They were very fair. And that's the kind of people I like to do business with. At Emerald Hills Rare Coins, in addition to coin collections, we buy estate jewelry and diamonds, sterling silver flatware, and all U.S. and foreign coins. Come by and visit with us and see how much your collection is really worth. That's Emerald Hills Rare Coins, 5832 Sterling Road, one and a half blocks east of 441 in Hollywood. This is CNN. Now a check of the headlines of the Persian Gulf crisis with less than four hours until the U.N. deadline for Iraq to pull out of Kuwait. <laughs> Thousands of people packed the streets of Baghdad in a government-orchestrated show of support for Saddam Hussein and hatred for the United States. Some shouted, the holy war is about to begin as they waved rifles and pictures of their president. Similar demonstrations were held in other Iraqi cities. Iraqi television shows pictures of Saddam visiting his troops on the front in Kuwait. State television says Saddam arrived Monday. It's not clear if he is back in Baghdad now. The Iraqi leader reportedly told his soldiers there will be no compromise on Kuwait, and he urged them to be ready for war. President Bush meets with economic advisors and top national security advisors, and he considers when and if to order an attack against Iraq. The White House says the president is at peace with himself and ready to make the tough decisions ahead. And spokesman Marlon Fitzwater underscored the president's warning that the war could come sooner rather than later after the deadline. 680,000 U.S. and Allied troops now are deployed in the Persian Gulf region. The Pentagon says Iraqi troop strength has climbed to an estimated 545,000, and Iraq's defensive line in Kuwait has extended farther to the west. U.S. officials say those are the latest signs that Baghdad has no intention of withdrawing. U.N. Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar makes a final urgent appeal to Saddam Hussein to pull out of Kuwait and avoid a war. Perez de Cuellar repeated assurances that Iraqi forces will not be attacked if they begin a decisive withdrawal. The Secretary General also assured Baghdad the international community will focus on solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Perez de Cuellar's pitch came after the collapse of last-minute peace efforts by the UN Security Council. And in Pakistan, the country's former Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto, offered to travel to Baghdad and mediate the Gulf crisis. Bhutto urged U.S. and United Nations officials to give peace a chance, as she put it, by extending the deadline for the Iraqi pullout to January 19th. Israeli radio is broadcasting around the clock as that country listens and waits for the deadline to pass. Last night, many people attended doomsday parties. Today, many are preferring to stay home in sealed rooms close to gas masks. CNN's Richard Roth has more from Tel Aviv. Sundown on Tel Aviv, heading into deadline day. A game of matcoat on the beach. Hard to concentrate, though. This is the city Saddam Hussein says he will attack with missiles if war breaks out. Longtime Tel Aviv residents detect fear in the city. People, I think people are a little bit worrying, you know. Saddam said uh, a few times that he will bomb Tel Aviv. And people are worrying and they're getting ready for him. Many stores were closed Tuesday evening. The normally busy avenues lack their usual vibrancy. Some of them, I think they run away from Tel Aviv. Some of them go to the south to Iraq, to the north. Even some people, they get a blow. A street musician plays on looking for change. A classical music and the New York Philharmonic were not enough for conductor Zubin Mehta. Instead of flying to New York for a rehearsal, Mehta headed south to Israel for the deadline. You know, it's my country and it's not my country and I can't stay away. And although I have, I don't have anything to conduct here, I feel, uh, I, f I just feel this is my place for the moment. I, I want to be with the people I love. He is not alone. American tourists seem to relish being here for the war deadline. Uh, I've never felt so good in my life being here. Earlier, the mayor of Tel Aviv toured local schools, checking on civil defense precautions. We are not in a panic. We, we handle it seriously. We consider it seriously, and we made all the preparation for if worse comes to worse. There was a big run on tape in Tel Aviv to seal up windows in the event of a chemical weapons attack. These children are learning some frightening lessons about the world. 
Yes, I ever got my name at my house. When I think that I finished work, I drive quickly to my house and put if the Saddam Hussein do something, I go quickly to my house. That's all. On the beach, this couple said they just got married on Monday. Yes, we didn't uh, know. We didn't know three, four months, um, four, three, four months ago. At the, it's our fortune. He said an extension of the deadline was not being considered. Many stayed close to the radio for the latest. Others said they already knew the outcome. I think for America, need four hours for destroying Iraq. Tel Aviv hopes Israeli officials are right in questioning the length and distance of Iraqi missile capabilities. Saddam Hussein vows to make Tel Aviv his first target should the multinational force attack him. And though they may be worried, the residents of Tel Aviv appear to be ready for anything. Richard Roth, CNN, Tel Aviv. One country caught in the middle and likely to be drawn in should war erupt is Jordan. Today, King Hussein urged his nation to stand united, saying war is imminent. Joining us now from Jordan's capital, Amman, with more, CNN's Doug James. Doug. Jordan's worst of fear, indeed, appears to be coming true. Caught in the middle between two powerful and unpredictable nations, Iraq and Israel, this kingdom of three million could now soon erupt into violence. More than half the people here are Palestinians, and tonight they took to the streets in one final outburst of anger before the UN-imposed deadline against Iraq takes effect. Hundreds carried candles and olive branches as they marched toward UN offices in Amman. They sang and chanted peace slogans, but ominously, they also warned the U.S. to get out of the Gulf or find its interests in Jordan under attack. The police were out in force as a result of the growing anti-American sentiment in recent days, feelings of anger which are certain to grow stronger in the militant Palestinian refugee camps here if and when war breaks out. Earlier, Jordanians huddled in front of their television sets to watch a nationwide address by King Hussein. Many were hoping for a miracle. Instead, they were shocked when they heard what amounted to a doomsday message. The alternative to this Arab settlement is the internationalization of this crisis, which leads to its complexification. Or the occurrence of war, whose drums we hear now, and which will cause untold horrors never seen before or witnessed in this region. So King Hussein, who, who uh, wanted to act as a mediator, tried to act as a mediator in the Gulf crisis, finally had to admit defeat. He looked tired and discouraged and hopeless, the last thing his three million subjects expected. This is Doug James reporting live from Amman. And just ahead, we'll map out Gulf War strategy with a military analyst. It's not the way we want the U.S. And we'll look at a day of U.S. anti-war activities from coast to coast. Hold it! Snap out of it! Do I look like dinner for a guy like you? I'm a one-course meal. You want the whole kit and caboodle. It's a real dining experience. Come here. Look at all these shapes and five yummy flavors plus stuffing. You see any stuffing here? Kit and Caboodle brand cat food. So many shapes and flavors, it makes other meals seem downright mousy. Ah, cats. Wherever your business takes you, the Gulfstream 4 can take you there. The Gulfstream 4 can take you nearly 5,000 statute miles nonstop, equaling or exceeding airline timetables. Or it can take you to several locations in a single day, optimizing your time and energies. No other business aircraft gives you global access with such uncompromised timeliness, convenience, and security. Most credit cards total your charges and send you a bill. But once a year, the Discover card totals your charges and sends you something in return. It pays to Discover. As you watch this, your money is changing hands. To find out how and why, you need the latest business news at 15 minutes into each half hour, only on Headline News. Tonight, 
the eve of the deadline in the Gulf, but there's still opposition in Congress for the use of force. Senator John Warner and Representative Joe Kennedy battle over U.S. tactics. Tonight on Larry King Live, 9 Eastern on CNN. I'm with James Blackwell, military analyst for the Center of Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. The deadline comes at midnight Eastern time in Washington. It's 8 o'clock in the morning in Iraq. It's 8 o'clock in the morning in Kuwait. Uh, not a very good time for attack or a good time. If you want to achieve surprise, of course, you'll attack uh, in, under cover of darkness. And you might even want to engage in your own kind of waiting game up to a point tactically. On the other hand, if Saddam Hussein's ready for a war and you're ready to take one to him, you don't really gain that much by waiting under cover of darkness. It could happen at 8 o'clock in the morning. It could happen at one minute after midnight, their time. Most every analyst says the air will be important at first. I guess you would agree with that. And show us the scenarios that are most likely if it's air first. I think there are three sets of targets that will be hit from the air. The first and most important under any scenario will be the air bases and the surface-to-air missile sites basically south of Baghdad that give Iraq some semblance of air power. The Allies will attempt to eliminate that, that power early on. They'll do that by launching long-range strikes from cruise missiles located in the battleships off the Gulf uh, and uh, in the Red Sea. They'll do that from long-range bombers, B-52s from Diego Garcia, F-111s out of Turkey and other places, that will reach into the depths of Iraq and try to kill the Iraqi Air Force and its missile forces on the ground. Then, once they have command of the skies, Allied Air Forces will then attempt to influence the battle on the ground. And they'll go basically for two kinds of targets. First, these same cruise missiles and bombers, perhaps a portion of the initial waves, will be dedicated to destroying the very key strategic targets throughout the depths of Iraq. That is, the military production facilities, the chemical weapons factories, and the nuclear weapons research laboratories. The third set of targets will be the ground targets that will influence the battle should it uh, boil down to a ground campaign. Fighters controlled by AWACS aircraft will fly into this area, perhaps even stealth fighters under both cover of darkness and uh, using their stealthy capabilities to penetrate remaining radar defenses to destroy and knock out ground forces command and control facilities, logistics sites, the things that allow the Iraqi army the ability to fight. Would there, during this period, be any expected movement of ground troops on either side? It seems to me that Saddam Hussein has a couple of sort of desperation moves he can do if he chooses not just to sit there and wait out an attack. And one of those options is a ground offensive of his own. The forces in Kuwait are relatively immobile. They're dug in. He's told them to stay there to fight to the death. But the other half of his force, located in northern Kuwait and in southern Iraq, south of Basra is very highly mobile and very potent. In fact, it's the force that led the invasion into Kuwait. He could, as, a, as an act of, uh, of desperation, order a counteroffensive, ordering that force to move around the flank of the Allied forces, attacking either into their rear or perhaps even striking into the depths of Saudi Arabia in a counteroffensive of his own. He certainly has that option, and if you're General Schwarzkopf and your planners, you have to be concerned about that possibility. What does he do to counter that? Schwarzkopf. There are two things that you have to do to counter it. First, you have to maintain some kind of economy of force formation out on that flank to give you warning of it happening. Secondly, you have to retain significant reserves so that if he maneuvers around you, then you have some force capability that can move against it, stop it in its tracks, and defeat it before the Iraqis can achieve their objective. He's done that. There are sizable forces in the rear, plus some very significant uh, air capabilities that are likely to be held in reserve specifically for that p potentiality. Militarily, is it fair to say that if it starts, there has never been anything like it? There hasn't been anything like this in recent history. Just in terms of the numbers, we're looking at a battle that uh, rivals the invasion of Normandy, if not more, as the force continues to grow. In terms of technology and firepower, there hasn't been anything like this in the 20th century. James Blackwell of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. This was a day when many U.S. citizens were hoping peace got a chance. Some used protest, 
For others, it was prayer. 24-hour church vigils are continuing in Dallas and Philadelphia. And in Washington tonight, a vigil in front of the White House. On the sidewalk and across the street in Lafayette Park, police say about 200 people are there now. It's been peaceful. As we reported earlier, a daytime demonstration outside the White House led to about 60 arrests. In California, anti-war demonstrators brought things to a halt on the Oakland Bay Bridge, linking San Francisco and Oakland. Police estimated the number of protesters at about 350. Traffic was backed up for miles at the start of the evening rush hour, but the bridge now is open again. Earlier, from one to 3,000 demonstrators blocked entrances to the federal building in downtown San Francisco. Police made over 400 arrests there. As night fell in cold and foggy Chicago, about 500 anti-war demonstrators marched up Michigan Avenue. There were no arrests reported. A protest in downtown Chicago yesterday drew up to 4,000 people. Still to come, a check of the world financial markets. And the former chief U.S. arms negotiator shares his views on the Persian Gulf crisis. How do you recognize the mature cat? Uh, he's the one with the dentures. Ooh, wrong. The one in the rocker? That's wrong. The one with the barely noticeable toupee. Oh, that's wrong. You can't always recognize the mature cat. His looks may not change, only his needs. Introducing new Cat Chow Mature brand. Recommended for cats over seven. Less fat and calories. Easy to chew. Because cats' needs can change. They're just not always easy to recognize. Thanks to an incredible new development at Pip Printing, you can now get these four color jobs for surprisingly few of these one color jobs. Full process color. One more reason Pip Printing's the biggest business printer in the world. Buongiorno. I'm in Italy enjoying one of the true specialties of Italian cuisine, the New York Strip. Mmm, perfecto. Boy, feels like I'm in the USA. Beef, real food in Little Italy, New York. Painful sore throat and no chloroseptic spray? That's okay. Chloroseptic lozenges actually work like this spray to penetrate nerve endings and stop pain fast. Great tasting chloroseptic lozenges. Fast relief when you're away from your spray. Their names were Nicholas, Balmer, Hogan. They wrote the book of golf. Now, TBS proudly adds another chapter to the annals of the PGA. For the first time ever, live primetime coverage of a PGA Tour event. Never before have you been able to witness golf's elite in primetime. When it happens, as it happens. Take a sport rich in tradition, place it in paradise, and you have the United Hawaiian Open. 8 Eastern Thursday, live and exclusively on TBS. Joining us from Washington to share his views on the prospect of a Gulf War, Paul Nitsa. Mr. Nitsa is a former arms control advisor and has worked in several presidential administrations. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Are we going to war? I believe we are. Soon? I think very soon. Perhaps within four hours. Are we rushing to war? I think it depends what one means by war. The thing that I object to is going into a large ground battle promptly. I think we ought to wait until we're sure that what we're doing on the ground is well prepared and that we're not going to run into heavy casualties. I don't think we need to. I think it's wrong to do that. I think we ought to exploit first the possibilities of the blockade and then of air power. Are you one of uh, the folks who say air power can be decisive in this case and force Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis to capitulate? Provided you give it time to work. Yes, I do think that. I do not believe it can necessarily work fast. I think we ought to avoid getting our ground troops committed until we're sure that Saddam Hussein's forces have been thoroughly weakened and are not capable of giving effective resistance. You're an effective diplomat. Give us a sense of these last-minute appeals today, one by President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, one by King Hussein of Jordan, and uh, this evening by the Secretary, Secretary General of the United Nations, Javier Perez de Cuellar. Any effect there? I, my reading of Saddam Hussein is that they would have no effect on him at all. Is he inviting this war? I'm not sure that that's the right way to, to phrase it. I think he feels a certain pride in standing up to the United States 
And he and I think many of his soldiers are prepared to go down fighting, that they consider that to be an honorable end and a better end than surrendering at this time. What is our military goal as, as you see it? Oh, I think our military goal is to see to it that the de decisions of the UN Security Council are in fact implemented. I thoroughly approve of those resolutions of the UN. They were arrived at in a proper manner, and I think we've got uh, full world support for those goals and for those resolutions. And I think it's incumbent that the, those be effectively implemented. However, sir, is there not a goal beyond the UN resolutions in that those who advocate going to battle also advocate destroying Saddam Hussein's war machine? And won't that be one of our intentions? No, I think that's a subsidiary goal. I think the main thing to do is to be sure that those UN resolutions are implemented and with the minimum casualties possible, but that they are implemented. And I certainly wouldn't compromise on those goals at all. How will this war, if it indeed comes, you're right, and you're right about this, how will that change the world? Let's take two cases. One is that we compromise with Saddam Hussein and that he isn't forced to implement the UN resolutions. Under those circumstances, I should think the message was clear to every dictator, every strong man in the world, that the thing to do is to stand up against the general will of the UN Security Council and go your own way and it'll be a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of a world. If, on the other hand, if indeed Saddam Hussein is forced to implement this, the UN Security Council resolutions, then one can see the prospect of a world in which the Security Council decisions can in fact be the basis for collective action in order to enforce sensible measures against the would-be dictators of the world. These are two entirely different world futures that we see before us, and they depend upon the outcome of this struggle. Paul Nitza, thanks for joining us, sir, from Washington. David? In tonight's Money Report, nervous oil traders in New York went on a selling spree just before the close of trading, and oil prices declined. Light sweep crude, the U.S. benchmark closed at $30.07 a barrel for February delivery, and that's down 71 cents. And Brent, North Sea crude closed at $28.19 a barrel, down 31 cents. White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater says the U.S. can deal with whatever disruptions in oil supplies might come with war. And the American Petroleum Institute says supplies of oil in the U.S. rose slightly last week. Inventories had declined during the previous weeks. Inventories totaled 323 million barrels in the week that ended Friday, and that's about 1.3 million barrels more than the previous week. The Money Report is brought to you by New Cherry Cream and Mint Cream Extra Strength Maalox Plus. Great new tastes and strong relief for all your Maalox moments. <sighs> there goes my stomach again. But I've had it up to here with this antacid taste. Then get great flavor up to here with the rich, fruity taste of Extra Strength Maalox Plus Cherry Cream. Up to here with the fresh, minty taste of mint cream. And up to here with the zesty lemon taste of lemon Swiss cream. The strongest antacid mm. tastes the best, too. Extra strength, Maalox Plus. Strong relief for all your Maalox moments. Maalox, you're the best. predict you'll have the best time every time for a free vacation kit with valuable discounts give us a call ready for some good news if your car is in an accident and you have all state insurance 
you can leave it in our hands. All states recommended pro shops can do everything, including the estimate, in one stop. And to make you feel even better, all state will guarantee their workmanship for as long as you own your car. Well, that's the news. Now, be careful. You're in good hands with Allstate, a member of the Sears Financial Network. Checking events in the Persian Gulf crisis. President Bush met with economic advisors as he stuck to a normal routine at the White House. The president is described as at peace with himself and ready to make the tough decisions ahead. The White House says not to expect any further U.S. efforts to encourage Saddam Hussein to leave Kuwait and avoid war. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney briefed lawmakers on U.S. war readiness. Cheney told reporters President Bush has not made a final decision on war. But he says if and when Mr. Bush makes that decision, the military is ready to carry it out. Cheney says there's no sign Iraq plans to honor the U.N. deadline to leave Kuwait. Iraq's president made that clear himself. Touring Iraq's front in Kuwait, Saddam Hussein told his troops there will be no compromise. He says he is sure his army is ready to take on the multinational force that it faces. Iraqi radio says soldiers and civilians greeted Saddam with chants of victory and God is great. U.S. Justice Department officials say the FBI has prevented more than five would-be terrorist attacks since the Gulf crisis erupted and today the U.S puts up its guard to protect against terrorism as the midnight deadline draws near. Security measures are beefed up in and around the U.S. Capitol, White House, and other key Washington locations. If fighting in the Gulf breaks out, Iraq has warned it would unleash a wave of terrorism. Airports, large and small, are increasing their security measures. The FAA says it's working closely with airlines and airports to protect travelers. The New York Stock Exchange also is affected. IDs are being double-checked and lunchtime food couriers are being banned. New York has set up a terrorist hotline to aid businesses with security problems. As worries of war concerned much of the world, some people in the U.S. took time to remember a man who stood for peace. Today would have been Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 62nd birthday. Statewide tributes are planned this week and next. Among them is a candlelight vigil this evening at the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. Some civil rights activists are angry that the U.N. deadline for Iraq falls on King's birthday. The National King holiday will be observed on Monday in most of the states. That concludes this edition of CNN Special Report, Crisis in the Gulf. I'm David French in Washington. Good night, Lou. See you later, David. And at the CNN Center in Atlanta, I'm Lou Waters. In a moment, more on the prospect of war in the Gulf. Tonight, Larry King's guests are Virginia Senator John Warner and Congressman Joseph Kennedy from Massachusetts. We leave you with a remake of the John Lennon song, Give Peace a Chance. Take care. Everybody's talking about planet Earth, rebirth, United Nations, good relations, space station, starvation, radiation, salvation, education, liberation, oh, oh.